Hey everyone, this is Paul with the Proteus Academy, and today I'm here to do a very long video. And that video is How to Get Better at Debate, a Master Resource. So, today I'm going to literally go over every single thing that I could think of about how to actually just get better at debate. It's not going to be like our other videos where it's like on how to get better at topicality or various things. I'm going to try and just literally cover what I've sort of boiled debate down to and the ways I think you can literally just improve at it. And probably I'll put timestamps in the description at some point. I'm not sure how long this will take to do everything, but hopefully you'll enjoy it. Before we get into the actual stuff, though, uh, I wanted some opening words. And this is a quotation from Duncan Thorn Shields, who's a journalist in the esports scene. And I've had this as a quotation from the time I transferred to Pacific, and to this day I use it as like the background on all my computers to sort of like remind myself things. But what it says is, if you have it within you, then success is not a leap of faith because you can rely on yourself to do what is necessary to succeed. Nevertheless, it does at time require a leap nonetheless away from what is easy and what is comfortable and familiar. And for me, that's really important in terms of shaping mindset for growth and for being willing to do the work, assuming you actually want to get good or get great at some point. And we'll be talking more about mindset later, but I just wanted to open with that. Getting right into it, the four domains of debate. So when I say domain, what I'm talking about is an overarching field of inquiry. The big meta level, grand in scope concepts that I think you can boil pretty much any part of debate down into. Um, and there's some overlap or some blur between these things, but the four things are, the four domains are content, mechanics, strategy, and oration. And we're going to talk about each one, one by one, and then we'll talk about a lot of ways to approve of those various domains. Beginning with content. Content has a few aspects to it, and the first aspect is general knowledge. And for some formats of debate, like potentially public forum and maybe BP, this is the only, well, you'll see in a second, but the only one that you really need to focus on, right? This is things like reading the news, reading books, just doing general research and trying to know about the world on some basic level and that can be like national news, international news, local news, scientific news, whatever kind of news it is, whatever kind of books it is that sort of you think are potentially beneficial to your just edification, to your learning. The second kind of content is philosophical knowledge. When we talk about philosophical knowledge, we're talking about the critique, right? Learning from different philosophers, and some of these philosophies are just incorporated into debate as, like, commonplace, and we don't call them, like, critical, even though they somewhat are, right? Um, for instance, potentially the ways people evaluate something that Deleuze said versus something that Locke or Kant said, right, where two of those philosophers just get taken and like, well, yeah, that's how it is. Um, learning about critiques is going to be absolutely essential in a variety of formats, and whether you like the critique or not, or whether you think the critique is fair or not, you probably should learn about it so that you can A, develop that opinion, and B, have a chance of answering or reading your own. It would be poor strategy to not learn. Debate knowledge. Debate knowledge is theory of debate and debate theory. So we're talking about how debates are actually run, what's happening in round, but also understanding how theory arguments work within debate, right? What is the basis, the sort of like meta level of what is happening in debate? And then lastly, we're talking about circuit knowledge. And I think circuit knowledge is one that people don't think about enough in a lot of respects. Um, in my experience in college, at least, especially where disclosure is a thing or where teams sort of talk to each other and our friends or whatever, uh, people go out of their way at the top to know what other people are reading and also to know like what judges actually care about voting on, right? You're, when you go through your career, by the time you're a senior, you hopefully have an idea of like, this is what I need to say in front of this specific judge and against this team, I can expect them to read these sort of arguments. Um, in PF, I know there's a culture around prep outs where it's like, oh, it's bad or whatever, but that's all you do in college debate is try and figure out like what are the best teams reading and then how will we answer that? You know, at the end of the year, a lot of teams heading into summer are like, okay, what did this team read at nationals? And like, well, how will we have answers to that come the fall? And I think that circuit knowledge is very overlooked and very important. You need to know your 
your opposition and you need to know your judges. And part of knowing your opposition is knowing who could help you potentially if you wanted to learn more about a specific criticism. This has been very impactful in my career. I love asking questions to other debaters and you can always learn something from someone else. Mechanics. When we talk about mechanics, we're talking about the processes, the physical things somewhat that we can do to actualize aspects of tactics and strategy. So one such mechanic is speaking, for instance, right? Your ability to speak at a given rate. Uh, prepping, the motions you go through and the processes you go through when you're preparing a case. And partly, obviously, you get a topic and 20 to 30 minutes later, you have to have a case on it. It's somewhat different in other uh, evidentiary formats of debate. Flowing, which I think is massively, massively overlooked. You have to be able to flow. You have to work on your handwriting because if you can't read your arguments, that's bad enough. If your partner can't read your arguments, that is absolutely terrible and will guaranteed lose you around at some point. Role playing. Role playing in this instance talks about understanding how to perform your role in a given speech, right? So in parliamentary debate, obviously sort of home base for me, when you are the PMC, functionally you just read a script, but when it comes up for the PMR, you're like closing all these doors and trying to win the debate. And the way I usually think of this as a difference is the difference between skilled positions and uh, strategical decision maker or strategic position maker decisions, right? The PM and the P, well, the PMR really, but the PMC, the person who does that speech is a strategic decision maker on the app, whereas the MG is sort of like the skill work speech, the technical speech, the line by line speech. And on the negative, on the opposition, the LOC is the person who does the like technical aspects of the debate. And the MO is the person who does those strategic decision making. It kind of gets blurred there because to a certain degree, the LOR is also really important with regards to strategy. But in general, this sort of holds up. And you need to be able to actualize once you know what each position is supposed to be doing. You need to be able to actualize via mechanics and via skill expression how to play that role most effectively. Strategy. Uh, there's a few branches of strategy we're going to talk about to try and... Because there's a million things we really could talk about. There could be case strategy. There could be dissent strategy. There could be politics dissent strategy. But I broke it down into broader categories. The first one being case strategy, right? So this is your ability to write a case, to construct a case that is strategic, right? That is considerate of uh, positions you think will be ran against it, to have front lines for those positions, or to have preamps built into the case itself, to have a diversity of offense, to have win conditions, to potentially do that while still maintaining a topical case. Round vision, which is maybe the most important skill in debate and in a lot of ways for me, which is understanding strategy as it is developing in the round, knowing where you need to go, which arguments to pick. This is argument selection. This is impact calculus. This is just knowing what's happening in the round or identifying how you are going to get a ballot in the end. Oration. Oration uh, is fairly simple. It's about voice and diction, right? This is the style of speaking. This isn't about speed, right? This is about persuasion in a lot of ways. This is your clarity. Uh, and some people might consider this skill work, but it's also like adaptation, right? You speak a certain way for a certain audience. Um, adaptation is the second thing, right? Knowing your judge and then being able to adjust the way you speak for that. Because if you're, you know, talking really slow in front of a very flow critic, you'll probably lose. And the same is true in the opposite direction. So we have finally arrived uh, at ways to improve. And I think that broadly, there are, I believe it was six ways to improve. The first area to improve, and we'll cover ways for each one, is your mindset. The second is using coaching. The third is debating, which largely takes place in practice or in tournaments. The fourth is review slash introspection. The fifth is skill work, which is largely composed of drills. And the sixth of observation. Sixth is observation, which is watching other rounds primarily. So let's talk about mindset. I think mindset's a really, really big issue. First, I think it's really important to be honest with yourself, your teammate, and your coaches. A lot of people don't want to acknowledge two things. One is the level they truly perceive themselves to be at, 
especially relative to their peers and to the other competitors. And two is the amount of work they're actually willing to put in. And in part, that's why I had that quotation at the beginning of this you know, lecture, this presentation. Because something I always told my students when I would you know, coach at Pacific and now at DVC is if you are viewing debate as just a social activity or you just want to learn a little bit, you want to have some fun, and you don't care about winning, that's completely fine you get to make the activity what you want of it, right? And I will coach you to that degree. The thing that annoys me the most is people who tell me they just want to win, that they want to be a champion, that they want to work really hard, and then don't. Because you can't do much with that person, and it ends up being a waste of your time and theirs. So it's very important to be honest about the degree to which you actually care about debate and improving. If you just want to have fun, no one's going to be upset about that. At least I'm not going to be upset about that. You get to do what you want. But I think lying to yourself and those around you about how much you actually want to improve is a recipe for disaster. Outcome independent thinking. This is really important in terms of mindset. If you want to get better at debate, then that's not about winning debates. That's about getting better at debate. You can get better at debate without winning rounds. In fact, I think a lot of times what makes people better at debate is losing rounds because that's the ones they tend to learn from. But overall, the point here is you need to, in the moments where you're practicing drilling all these kinds of things, it can't be about, I want to win this, I want to win this. Because then you'll take the easy way out or you'll exploit things that won't necessarily be there in these high-level rounds. That brings us to coaching. Find a coach or ask your existing coach what to do. This probably isn't an option for some of you, right? That's why Proteus Academy exists, because we wanted to raise equity. But I really can't overstate the importance of just getting good coaching. Having a coach was absolutely instrumental to me, not just because I learned a lot. Like I, I would say Steve, my coach at Pacific, and my dear friend, taught me 70% of what I know about debate, like just an absolute ton. Whereas my coach, Tony, didn't teach me nearly as much, but inspired me and gave me the passion that made me want to transfer to Pacific and just made me commit my life to it today and to the point where basically I have the job he had when I met him. One second, I'm going to drink some water. <clears throat> yeah, so in that regard, I think that finding a coach is incredibly important because coaches, in theory, if you get a good one, and even if you don't get a good one, can like having an outside voice or having an expert outside voice can just resolve a lot of the issues you have because they've probably been there or at a minimum they can tell you things that would improve. On debating slash practice. Somewhat this ties back into outcome independent thinking, but stop trying to win in practice. That doesn't mean stop winning. What I mean by that is if you go into practice rounds and you're thinking, today I'm going to smash my teammates, especially the teammates, like if you're the A team, right, and you're just miles better than everyone or whatever, like that is a waste of your time. You should be expected to beat these debaters who aren't as good as you or these teams who aren't as good as you. But that's not going to make you better because eventually if you're focused on winning, what happens is you just identify where those individuals are weak and then you exploit that. Or you identify a strength of yours and you exploit that. And you don't get any better because you're running away from the areas of debate where you are deficient. Fix it, focus practice is the other thing. You need to have an objective. You need to identify mistakes you've made. Weaknesses or strengths are fine too. And then decide to cultivate those things. Some people choose to just ignore their weaknesses and develop their strengths. You can do that if you want to. But the bottom line is... You shouldn't just be debating in practice. I think that's a terrible way of actually improving in general. Just debating in general is not an efficient method of getting better at debate because the kind of scenarios you actually need to work on might not even come up in the round. And if they do, they might come up once, whereas with drilled work or specific focused work, you can do a ton of those scenarios and really improve on it, right? I think that just practicing collapsing to like the same K all year makes teams like incredibly effective in debates. It's almost always best to have a spectator judge slash coach, I think. This helps with the whole win thing because then you don't decide amongst yourselves. But also, it's sometimes, and not even sometimes, I would say quite frequently difficult for people to have an honest evaluation of what happened in the round. And as a result, 
it's important for others to notice. This is especially true of like speaking style things. People won't notice the way they speak or whatever, and that can cause issues perceptively, which are going to matter to a judge because ultimately it is a judged activity, and that is how you win ballots. Nothing else you do can replace just getting the reps in. Know what you don't know. I just said a second ago that I think debating and practicing – Rather, debating for practice isn't a good means of improvement. And I still think that's true. But at a certain point, you have to just be in a ton of debate rounds because it's the only way to really understand the sort of resistance that teams exert, to understand how you will perform in the heat of the moment, to familiarize yourself with the type of arguments that are out there, and then to identify patterns that are occurring with regards to how your results are coming about based on the things you are working on. On review slash introspection. So when I talk about review and introspection, I'm talking about looking at your own rounds, whether that's by keeping the flows, taking notes from what judges say, recording what you did, and then performing a self-analysis. And critical in that is to record rounds. I really think recording both your practices, like your drills that you do by yourself, practice rounds with your team, rounds you're actually in, is crucial to your development because it gives you an honest evaluation of where you're at relative to whoever you were debating in that moment or where you were at in a given time period for purposes of comparison. I think post-round debriefings also really matter. If you're in a partnership, when the round ends, potentially even before the decision, I would even recommend before the decision, you should be talking to your partner about, like, what did we do wrong? How could we have improved that? Blah, 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 blah. A little two-minute discussion. And then after the judge's decision comes out, you can reflect on, okay, so given the context of what the judge says, what was important, what wasn't important, etc. I always tell my kids that when the judge is disclosing and giving feedback, you should write that shit down. Because if you do write it down, it allows me as a coach to see that feedback rather than just trust things you said about like how the judge made the decision because I'm going to say eight out of ten times when coaches go talk to uh, judges who judge their kids, they get a very different story than they did from the student. Actually write down the judge's feedback. I already said that. Uh, and then this one's important. Keep a record of what to focus on and what to improve. I think the idea in practice in particular of going into the practice rounds and before you ever go in saying, like, this is what I'm going to focus on for this practice round, and then afterwards, based on how the round went, having uh, a record of, okay, what to fix or what to fo focus on from that particular round is a great way of identifying patterns in what you're doing incorrectly or areas of growth, which can, you know, sort of affirm your work. On skill work, drills, this is where I'm sure a lot of you are – going to actually enjoy the video. Maybe I'll just skip here. But this is just where I'm going to talk about a variety of drills that I think are useful for actually improving your skill work, right? Speed drills, the pen drill, the watermelon drill, the backwards drill, and the fast forwards drill. We're going to go through each one. Oh, I also lied. There's one last thing. Memorize stuff. Because if you don't memorize stuff, a lot of this doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you can read really fast off of a file if you don't get that file in round. So a note on speed drills. Speed kills. Don't let speed be a crutch for your debating. Literally no judge cares that you can mumble 400 words for a minute. This is just true. Um, there's certainly a thing that's fast enough, and there's certainly a thing that is too fast. But more importantly, a lot of debaters just do speed drills and don't get better at any aspect of debate, and that doesn't make you a good debater. It might make you a good rapper, but, you know, that's about it. Frequently change the thing that you practice spreading and keep it under five minutes. I find that when people just spread the same exact thing over and over again for weeks or months or even a year at a time, that they develop a type of muscular memory that potentially isn't good for them because they, they get into, like, these rhythms of saying words and just trying to say them so fast that the words, like, lose all meaning and sort of blur together, which is less than ideal. And so changing the thing you're spreading forces you to just learn how to talk fast in general and read fast in general rather than learning how to read a specific passage at a given rate. Also, keep it under five minutes. I think this is important because... There's definitely uh, like a burnout and fatigue factor to like going for extended periods of time. And when I say five minutes, I mean the specific like drill, right? So when I would do speed drills, and you'll see that in just a second, right? 
uh, each individual section was under five minutes, but doing all of them together might take 20 minutes and you could repeat it X amount of times. Always record your speed drills for evaluation purposes. I think it's a great idea to have a uh, recording because if if you just spread and call it a day and don't like record it and listen back, then you have no idea if you were clear at all, if there were areas where there are weaknesses, if there are certain words you need to work on or certain like, uh, you know, consonants you're not saying clearly whatever or just trends and like oh the first word i say is always really quiet or it's too loud or whatever lastly i uh, think lastly make a spreadsheet uh to track your progress i had a spreadsheet that was just what was the date what was the thing i spread how many words was that thing how long did it take me and then it would calculate how many words per minute i did and then it just tracked it over time so that i could see um the progression that occurred i lied Keep the minimum effective dose in mind. When I say this, what I'm talking about is doing 20 minutes of spreading every day or just speaking drills, speech drills, speed drills every day uh, is probably going to make a pretty big difference for you. And I think that it's really easy to find 20 minutes to do these kind of practices. But doing three hours isn't going to be like I don't know how three and isn't going to be nine times better. It might be 50 to 60% better. Right. And so your time is probably better spent in other areas. This is also true of reaching a certain speed threshold, right? There's, like I said earlier, there's, I think it's fast enough. You don't have to be the fastest debater in the country uh, by any means. In fact, only one person can be at any given time. So you need to be fast enough to engage in these high level rounds, but not much faster than that. I lied again. Also, do these drills in order, which we'll be talking about when you see the actual drills. The pen drill. You put a pen in your mouth horizontally, ideally pushed back to your molars. And it says no, but it should say, now read your material with a focus on exaggerating the words you are saying. This drill should be done at a conversational or just above conversational speed. Do not try and go fast here. The purpose of this drill is to develop clarity, right? And so... I'm not on video, so it would be hard to like show you this, but it's a fairly explanatory drill. You just put a pen across your teeth functionally, and then you over-exaggerate while you say things. Because because your tongue is like under something, you have to really exaggerate, which then when you remove the pen, is sort of like Goku removing the training weights, which is something we do twice throughout this process that I think uh, will really help you. The watermelon drill. Read your material at a medium, and this should be the same material again, and you should do these in this order, so pen, then watermelon. Read your material at a medium to fast speed while saying the word watermelon between each word. An example is, I, watermelon, pledge, watermelon, allegiance, watermelon, etc. throughout the entire passage that you're doing. This takes a while for a lot of people. Um, but it's really good because the, it doesn't have... Oh, sorry, I should have said this. It doesn't have to be watermelon. Some people just say the letter A, so... Sorry, uh... I, A, pledge, A, etc. The purpose of this drill is to develop both clarity and reading skills. It forces you to focus on what you're actually reading. I think that's really important because, again, if you just read the same thing all the time, we can't guarantee you're actually learning how to read uh, like quickly and to translate the visual information into verbal information. So doing this drill forces you to actually identify what you're reading while you're saying it. But also to, in a certain context, ignore the individual, or rather, not ignore the individual words, ignore the total context of a sentence to focus on the words. Because in theory, if you're reading something, it's something you're familiarized with or something you came up with. And so you don't need to be reading it for content. You just need to be reading it for actual words and for delivery. The backwards drill. You're going to just read your material backwards as fast as you can without sacrificing a ton of clarity. Um, you can sacrifice a little clarity, right? It's a, a bit odd at times to do this drill for people, but the goal here is definitely to uh, be picking up the pace uh, and communicating in a way that is understandable, obviously. It's always our goal. The purpose of this drill is also to teach you how to focus on the individual words you are reading. This is really important when it comes to reading things you've never read before, which happens quite frequently, right? Let's say your partner just hands you a sheet of paper or a new block or something to that effect, and you've just got to read it in the moment. Or maybe you're with a different partner than normal, and, and that kind of changes the way that things are working between the two of you. 
Um, I actually want to go back real quick. So just to give you an example of this, uh, in the context of this passage here, this second bullet point, that would look like, uh, I'm not going to do a top speed or anything, but like, before read, never have you things reading to comes in, when important really is this, reading are you words, etc., etc., etc. That's what I say backwards, that's what I mean. So the last drill that I do is the fast forward drill. And this one's uh, also fairly self-explanatory. It's done in two parts, though. First, without worrying about clarity, you attempt to go about 10% faster than you think your maximum rate is, uh, and you force yourself to go as fast as you can. This is a really short sentence here or whatever, so it's it's not great for doing this, but like if I was just trying to like overexert myself, it might be like... Push that way, you clearly attempt to go up as fast as you think about it, but you force yourself to be as fast as you can. Like, do you see how, like, I sacrifice clarity there to just try and force myself to say words really fast. And then the second thing you do is now you dial it back to, like, 90 to 95% of your top speed and focus on clarity. And this is, again, one of those, like, training weight style exercises where because you tried to go so fast or whatever uh, originally and that was too much for you, relatively speaking, when you reduce that speed to what is still a very high speed for you, it feels more comfortable. Some people will do this with, like, um, weight training almost, where they'll try and like do a rep at 50 when really they want to do a rep at 45, just so that it seems almost lighter when you do it. The purpose of this is obviously develop speed. That's it's called the fast forward drill, and you could probably tell from how that went that, that that's the purpose. Now we're on speech drills. Speech drills are different than speaking drills. Speaking drills are about literally how you speak. Speech drills are about how you perform given speeches. So, the number one speech drill that I like, it's something that I took from Sam Cooke, which is compressions and insertions, and this takes quite a while, 30 minutes plus. The other kind is speech do-overs, 15 to 30 minutes. Three is focus drills, which uh, aren't necessarily a specific thing. It's a variety of different drills you could attempt to do, and they take sort of five minutes to as long as you want. Compressions and insertions. So, you find around that you need to watch slash flow, you flow the round up until the point of the speech that you want to give, but don't listen to the actual speech. So uh, in PF terms, maybe you want to practice doing the summary, and so you would stop either at the summary before yours, or you would stop at the rebuttal before the summary. If it was parley, you would stop. If you wanted to do, let's say, the MG, you would stop after listening to the LOC. Then you give the speech for however long it takes to give a perfect speech. So in... Parley in MG is normally eight minutes, but you if you need 30 minutes to give a perfect speech where you cover absolutely everything in the way you wanted to, then that's what you do here. 30 minute speech. After that, you reduce the speech time from whatever that 30 minute one, let's say, was by two minutes or by some increment, and you just do it over and over again. So you do a 28 minute speech, a 25 minute, you know, 20, 18, 17, this, and that's why this takes so long, right? Depending on how much you incrementally reduce it by. And usually I do this until I'm one minute under the true speech time. So if the MG is eight minutes, I do it until it's a seven minute speech. And this is a really, really good drill because it's one of the only things that I think teaches you round vision without having to be in a round. Because by iterating on the speech over and over again, you eventually come to a point in time where you've identified what actually mattered, and hopefully that applies across rounds rather than just in this specific round. And it's very, very good for time management and things of that nature as well, obviously. Speech do-overs, also self-explanatory. Just redo a speech that you've done previously, but better. And that's about identifying specific aspects of the speech that weren't great. Or, and I, I personally find that you should record this because then you could compare the various redos that you've done over time, see which one was best, and then analyze maybe why one of those was better than a different one. Additionally, I think you should try to, as I've said, really focus on a singular thing. Sometimes I do speeches that I think might be worse, but because I want to practice going for a different element, right? Let's say it's the MO and we're going to collapse in the block and uh, parley, um, and I can go for the K or I can go for T. Even if T is the right strategy, sometimes you want to do it practicing going for the K just so that you have a wider wheelhouse and a range of things you can do in any given round. It's also great to do with a partner or a coach. I think it's actually probably a must do in some respects with a partner and coach unless you don't have one in which case just do recording because then you have someone to guide you through that process right of like here's what i would have worked on in this one i want you to focus on incorporating these things focus trolls 
Focus drill is where you just pick an area of debate that you're bad at answering and then set a time limit to generate as many answers as you can, right? So, you know, you sit down either by yourself or with a coach and just be like, uh, okay, answers to cap, cap bad, cap good, whatever it is, and you just come up with answers. You can modify the drill by making yourself only do offense or defense, right? Like, I'm only going to read turns. I'm only going to read independent disads. I'm only going to read uh, no link arguments, impact defense, etc. And I think this is a really great way to develop upon your blocks, right? Because it helps you identify. Sometimes um, with block debaters in particular, they'll have a block of eight things. And then they think they have to read all eight of those things in every instance. But doing drills like this can either let you identify which ones you don't think you actually need, which ones you would do if you had 30 seconds as opposed to one minute, etc. to really iterate upon those blocks. Which means this is prep drills. Do some prep. Uh... Write, writing cases can, is considered prep. Obviously, writing blocks is considered prep. And if, if you're doing parley, like, literally just pick a topic and then set a given amount of time to write a case on a given side of it. And this last bit, I think, is really important. No one does this. And I don't really know why, but you probably should. I find that almost no one I know bothers with prep drills and for me it was instrumental not only as a student because then I didn't have to in parley obviously you prep as a team in college with like coaches I didn't have to rely on coaches telling me anything because like I knew how to prep myself but it also meant that when I became a coach I was better able to do so I think it helps you help your teammates and so uh, a lot of times people ask like hey hey I'm the team captain or I'm you know the best debater on my team or whatever like what can I do to help my teammates and I think this is a good example of how you can improve yourself and in doing so improve the general uh, sense of knowledge on your team. Block drills. You should write blocks. You should memorize blocks. And uh, I'm going to provide you with just a list of blocks that I think are useful. I really want to know the memorizing blocks, right? I think that if you're having to read everything off of an actual doc outside of evidentiary debate, and even then it's not the, the ideal situation in some respects, uh, that you're not really reaching that elite tier. Everyone who's very, very good has core arguments memorized that are analytical and that they can use. List of blocks. Uh, answers to theory, right? Answers to tricks or procedurals, as you might call them as well, depending on your format. I think everyone needs answers to topicality. I think everyone needs answers to conditionality, long-form framework, and various specification arguments. Answers to critiques. Uh, you can view this as answers to specific critiques, right? Like you could learn your answers to the lose or answers to marks or whatever. But it's also just learning like how you generally have generics against alternative answers, or rather against alternatives, uh, disads, permutations, and solvency takeouts. And then impact blocks. I think that if you're not memorizing like internal link stories leading up to M blocks, impacts and like how you would explain that impact, why that impact controls the internal link to another one, then you're doing yourself a disservice. Memorizing stuff. It's really important to have internal link and impact stories memorized, which is what I just said, so let's not worry about it. And I think that memorizing frameworks for answering critiques in theory are really important, and I provided an example here. So this might look like nonsense, the WMCI, WMCI, OGYB, DVPA, R. Uh, but to me, it's a framework for answering topicality. And what it really says is, we meet counterinterpretation. We meet our counterinterpretation. Ours is good. Yours is bad. Don't vote on potential abuse in reasonability. Like default to reasonability. And so what we're saying is we meet your interpretation. Here's our counterinterpretation. We meet our counterinterpretation. Here's a standard that is an offensive reason to prefer ours. Here's a standard that is a reason as to why your interpretation is bad. Don't vote on potential abuse. It's like voting on potential disads and then default to reasonability. And I think you need frameworks like that for when you're trying to answer theories and critiques. I used to just write this down. I'd literally write down WMCI, WMCI. OG, UIB, et cetera, down my sheet of paper. And then when I was in round, if I I would just look at that. I wouldn't actually have the we meet written down or whatever written down, other than really the counter interpretation. But I just knew that I had to proceed through that checklist as I was going through answering the position. Right case. I think you should just read a book and try to write a K. Even if you're not particularly interested in critical literature or if it's not popular in your format, it, it might expand your horizons and it might help you answer stuff if you really hate them. Like You might as well know about the thing that you're talking shit about all the time. Also, talk to smart debaters and coaches. Stop being socially awkward cowards and just ask for help. To this day, I ask competitors and coaches for their views on how to best do something all of the time. Uh, during my career... I was fascinated by this, right? I just, I read a book and basically they just mentioned like, yeah, uh, a lot of the time, if you just reach out to someone who was like a, 
bronze medalist in the Olympics, they'll just kind of respond because, you know, they're not a gold medalist, so they didn't get a ton of the attention or whatever, but they're still, like, one of the three best people in the world or something. I think me and Sasan have talked about this before. And that doesn't necessarily apply in the context of debate, but, like, most people are your peers, right? And they're if they're coaches, they're interested in education for the most part or money, one or the other. And um, if they're competitors, then they're probably just willing to explain it to you. On observation, I think people need to watch rounds, live rounds, watch videos of rounds, and most importantly, flow those rounds. I think just watching rounds is insufficient. And I don't think that... I think this is actually what happens a lot of time in like... When I see videos from PF videos or whatever, people comment like, oh, this team definitely got robbed or whatever. But then they didn't necessarily flow the round and they're just saying it based on like what they thought <laughs> as I guess a lay critic or something. But I think that if you flow the round, it really helps you understand the structure and how things are functioning. Learning from your own mistakes will make you a good debater, but learning from the mistakes of others will make you a great one. And that's why I think that introspection uh, is a great thing, but isn't necessarily enough, right? If you're only learning from the mistakes you make, you're going to learn much slower than someone who identifies the mistakes that others makes and then, or the excellent things that others do and then incorporate those into your game. These are my closing words. Uh, this quote looks kind of dumb, and it's, I never knew that I could do it until I did, though I often thought as much. I wrote this quote. Uh, I've reworked it a few times. And it, it still doesn't make a, a ton of sense on face. But what I'm trying to say here, and what I hope potentially gives you some motivation or inspiration or whatever, is that when I got into debate, I got into it in college, at a community college. And I'd never done debate in high school, middle school, or anything like that. And I spent my first two years on a community college team that didn't have very much coaching, really, and that certainly wasn't successful regionally, let alone nationally or anything like that. But I really wanted to be good, and I really thought that I could be good. And it w when I say I never knew that I could do it, what I mean is there was no certainty. It wasn't guaranteed that I would be relatively successful at debate, right? I never won the national championship like I wanted to, but, you know, I was ranked one for a while and, you know, won like 150 debates and lost like 25 and won some pretty big tournaments, was a two-time national semifinalist. But I never knew for sure that I could do any of that. I just thought that I could. And that drove me to work on self-improvement. And like I said at the beginning, if, if you're not interested in really trying to pursue excellence, then that's totally fine. You're not required to. But if if you believe that you have it within you, I think you have an obligation to try and express that and to do as best you can. And I hope this video was useful for all of you. Uh, and until next time, have a good one.